I hope that what I'm going to talk to you about today will be relevant. Um, I'm going to start with uh, giving you an example of how our programs, the things that we've done over the years in Africa and elsewhere, have been relevant to security concerns, um, and then try to delve into the approach that uh, we're recommending. And much of what I'm going to say today is uh, covered in this little blue book called the, S the Guide to Governance Reform. And uh, because we think governance reform is at the heart of security strategy. But uh, we will uh, send a copy of this to, to Carl and he's going to put it on uh, the website so that you can get a, get a copy of it if you like. And I'll check and see if, I know we don't have it in Portuguese, but we might have it in French, I'll check. So let me just start by giving you a little sense of what is the Center for International Private Enterprise, SIP, as we call it. This is a program that was first proposed by President Ronald Reagan in a very famous speech he made in Westminster at the uh, British Parliament. You're not allowed to say that he spoke in the British Parliament because foreigners can't do that. So he spoke at Westminster to the members of the British Parliament. And in that speech, he proposed to work with the private sector, not meaning just business, but political parties, trade unions, other NGOs, and countries around the world to build the representative institutions of democracy. And he used the phrase, which I really like, called the infrastructure of democracy. And by that, he was talking about the institutions that make up the governance system. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because when we think of the security threats, it can't simply be you know, getting through the guard post or the more obvious issues. It, it goes to the broader questions. And let me give you an example of that. Uh, some of you may be, have heard of Hernando de Soto. He, was a, he is a brilliant uh, leader in his native country of Peru. And when he returned to his country in the early 1980s, there was a bizarre situation developing. People were coming out of the woodwork talking about Mao. And they formed something called Sendero Luminoso the Shining Path, which became one of the most violent guerrilla movements ever seen. Well, De Soto said, look, there's got to be a reason why so many people are coming out of the countryside or coming out of the cities, out of the inner cities and joining this. What is that reason? And he discovered that it was the existence of something called the informal sector the sector informal in Spanish. But these are the people that are locked out of the formal economy. They're operating without business licenses, without permits, without property rights, and they're very, very vulnerable to corruption, to the threat, to recruitment by violent extremists. And one of the most recent examples that we've seen of this is Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia was the young street vendor who self-immolated and sparked off what we came to be called the Arab Spring. Of course, we're now in the Arab winter because the Arab governments didn't do a good job of answering that dramatic call. But he self-immolated in protest because all of his goods had been seized. He had no property rights, no recourse to gov government or law. The system didn't work for him. So one of the questions that has to be at the heart of any country's security issue is, does the system work for the people? And if it doesn't, what do we need to do to make it work? And that isn't just a question for political leaders or academics or economists or the private sector operating through their chambers of commerce. It is also a question for the whole society. And so it is fundamentally a security issue. And you say, okay, well, how big is the informal sector in Africa? Recent studies that have come out have said that anywhere up to 40% of the economy, 60 to 70% of the workforce may be trapped in that informal sector. So I submit that this is an issue that needs to be taken into account. But there are many others. 
The issue of corruption is systemic. And I don't need to tell you, you know it far better than I do. This is a very big threat to the well-being of countries. Over $150 billion a year come out of the African economies through corrupt payments. This is a huge cost to the economic development of the countries. And fundamentally, these come back to governance issues. And that is what I wanted to talk to you about. Because the, the approach that was developed by the Center for International Private Enterprise was based on interaction with the international business community and the national business communities. And we have worked in most of the countries, well, a good number of the countries in Africa, ranging from Nigeria to Senegal to Ethiopia, Kenya, of course, South Africa and others, uh, and Ghana. And so what I'm going to be telling you is informed a bit by that experience as well. The heart of the SIPE approach is that you cannot import solutions. There may be all kinds of great international examples of best practices, the way things should be done. There are textbooks full of them. The World Bank publishes them, but you can't simply import them. And I'll give you an example. In the country of Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia, uh, early on in our experience, we tried to work with the Georgian government to write a new operational code for how the country should be governed, managed, the day-to-day -day processes. And we found out from one of our partners, a think tank in Georgia, that it, it, the code was written, translated into Georgian and Russian, which is their second language, but never implemented. And so we said, why? It's a beautiful code. It's, it's really the, the best international code you could get. Well, that's true, but number one, the government officials in Georgia, the civil servants, had no idea what this was about. They had no training in it. And two, the local population didn't know anything about it. So we worked with this think tank, the private sector initiatives think tank, and the universities in Tbilisi and other parts of Georgia to begin organizing local communities to demand implementation, to demand reform, but very specific kinds of reforms. And that led us to develop the process or methodology approach that we use in this manual. And let me just give you some examples of what it is. First, it's based on what you're talking about today, institutions and institutional analysis. But we use the word institutions in the way that is being used by something called the new institutional economics, again referred to in this publication. But that is a branch of economics that says you can't just assume that property rights exist, that the government functions that the rule of law is in place. You have to look at each one of these things. So the first step that we do with our partners, which are local organizations, we always partner with a domestic organization because we don't know enough about another country to come and tell them what to do. What we can do is find out what the local organization, the Chamber of Commerce or the think tank or the business community is trying to do and then help them accomplish that if we feel that it would be a good thing to accomplish. So the very first thing we tell people is, here's the question you have to ask yourself. Why do things work the way they do? That's the very first question. You can't just come in and assume you know better. You have to figure out, why is this the way things are happening? If there's corruption, why is that there? If there isn't property rights, if Muhammad Bouazizi sets himself on fire, why? What happened? So the very first, we have a seven-step program, again described in this little booklet here, called The Steps in Building a Reform Agenda. And I'll just run through them quickly, and if you have questions, we can talk about it. First, identify the initial conditions. What's actually going on in this country? And this is extremely important, especially for French-speaking countries that follow the civil law as opposed to the British common law. Civil law is a very different system. And you can't just use 
common law approaches in a civil law country. And I can tell you later what the reason for that is, but finding out why things work the way they do is very, very important. And that's the step of identifying the initial conditions. What are the barriers? What are the true costs of doing business? What are the underlying problems? And then write those up and publicize them so that the people in the country can share with each other their views. Number two, locate the key points of change. What institutional reforms will generate a private sector response? So when you talk to the business community, you don't say to them, here's the kind of tax code you need. Instead, you say to them, what is the main reason you're not expanding your business? What is keeping you from growing? And it might be tax systems. It might be the cost of complying with taxes. It might be property rights. It might be any number of things. But I identify what are the key points of change. What institutional reforms, if they were put in place, would really help those people? Then number three, mobilize the business associations, the Chamber of Commerce, if it's a private group. And unfortunately, in many French-speaking countries, it's a governmental organization. So you have to look for the private sector organization, the think tanks and other civil society groups, and work with them to develop what's called a collective action program, a program that's designed to mobilize them to put forward to their government officials the changes that need to be made, what needs to be done. But specific changes, not we need a better tax code. What does that mean? No. It means you've got to be very specific about what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. That's the number four point, which is generating specific policy recommendations, such as reforming the customs procedures. You know, if the customs authorities are really difficult to deal with, it's very hard to engage in international commerce, which is a key thing for many developing countries, especially countries that are dependent, as so many African countries are, on commodity exports oil, rice, cocoa, coffee, whatever it may be. Then number five, create reasonable expectations and manage them by saying, setting out achievable goals. You know, if you set a goal that's just almost impossible to ac accomplish in the next two years, people didn't just get disappointed and walk away and say, oh, it's a waste of time, it's not gonna change. You have to set out things that can be reasonably done. And the case studies that I've given to Carl, which are available to you, do provide examples of that in very specific countries, which are not easy to generate reforms. Then number six, mount an aggressive campaign of what we call advocacy. Advocacy is mobilizing the community, setting out goals, and then creating a campaign to get it into the newspapers, to dramatize it, to mobilize the general public, to talk to people about your country will be better off if we can all get together and do this. And then lastly, once the ideas are implemented, be sure to recognize the government officials that have done the job. You've got to give them credit because that's how you're gonna get others to do it once they realize that they can get support, that people will follow them, that, oh my God, I did this and it worked and now look at how popular I am. Well, it's called self-interest. So give them the credit for what they have done. It, it makes a huge difference. Now also evaluation is a really important aspect of this. You need to evaluate the projects and evaluate what worked and what didn't and why it worked and why it didn't. And there's techniques and methodologies for doing that. There's a whole industry based on evaluation and you can hire people to do that. But again, we recommend using, making sure that the advocacy program, that the reform agenda has very specific things in it. And then once they're accomplished, find out why they were accomplished or why they weren't and learn from that, and then go back and repeat the cycle again. Now this approach has an added value in that once the business community, 
the other civil society organizations, the think tanks, the universities, and others begin to see what's happening, there's a learning process that goes on. And they begin to incorporate these ideas then into their future goals and future objectives. And so you begin to get a, a process of iterative change, of change that builds on itself and creates a process of reform and success. Now, I could go on for a very long time, but I, I had promised that I wouldn't. So if that's sufficient as an introduction, um, let me just tell you the name of our website. It's www.ci. P, like Paul, E, that stands for Center for International Private Enterprise, .org. And you'll find lots of materials on there, including video presentations by people like Hernando and others, uh, interviews, podcasts, but also all of this material is on there as well. And lots of program examples from Africa and other regions as well. So thank you very much.